A very good morning, everybody. On behalf of India Foundation and BSC, it gives me Manasi great pleasure in extending a hearty welcome to all of you on the day two of the India Economic Summit 2018 with the theme, A New Economy for New India. Yesterday, last evening, we saw Honorable Union Minister Shri Suresh Prabhuji, Honorable Union Minister for State Shri Jain Sinaji for the inaugural session, followed by the Chief Minister's panel comprising Honorable Chief Minister of Maharashtra Shri Devendra Fadnavishji and Honorable Chief Minister of Assam Shri Sarbanand Sonowalji. Today, we begin with a panel discussion on jobs for all harnessing India's demographic dividend. We have Shri Rajan Bharti Mittal, Shri Abhishek Mangal Prabhat Lodha, Shri Amitabh Kant, and Dr. Shamika Ravi on the panel. Welcome, everybody. A quick introduction of all the experts. Shri Rajan Bharti Mittal, Vice Chairman and Managing Director of Bharti Enterprises, set up Bharti Enterprises with his brothers year 1980. He is currently serving in a number of leadership roles on board of trustees of Brookings Institution, the president of ICC, the International Chamber of Commerce in India, and in the past served as the president of FICI, the Federation of Indian Chambers of Commerce and Industry, holds a master's from Harvard Business School. Welcome, uh, Mr. Mittal. We have Sri Abhishek Mangal Prabhat Loda, managing director and chief executive officer of the Loda Group. The company is among India's top real estate companies known for its world-class commercial and residential properties. The majority of properties are located in Mumbai. They also have a presence in Hyderabad, Pune, and London. He holds a master's degree in science, industrial and systems engineering, supply chain, and logistics from the Georgia Institute of Technology, United States. Previously worked for McKinsey and Company in the US. Welcome, Mr. Lodha. Shri Amitabh Kant, Chief Executive Officer of the Niti Aayog, a National Institute of Transforming India. He is a member of the Indian Administrative Service, author of Branding India, an Incredible Story, and has been a key driver of Make in India, Startup India, Incredible India, and God's Own Country initiatives, which positioned and branded India and the state of Kerala as leading manufacturing and tourism destinations. Welcome, Mr. Kant. And then we have Dr. Shamika Ravi, member of the Economic Advisory Council to the Prime Minister. Additionally, she is Director of Research at Brookings India and a Senior Fellow of Govern Studies Program at Brookings India and Brookings Institution, Washington, D.C. Her focus is on financial inclusion, health, gender inequality, and urbanization. A visiting professor of economics at the Indian School of Business, where she teaches courses in game theory and microfinance. Completed her PhD in economics at New York University and is receiving MA from the Delhi School of Economics. With those words, I leave the charge of the session to Dr. Shamika Ravi. Over to you, ma'am. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Shamika Ravi. Welcome to the conference and to the morning session. Uh, you know, we have decided the format to be one of highly interactive ones. So we have just requested mics for everyone uh, on the panel here. But let me start, while they're getting those mics, let me start by introducing the topic, uh, which is jobs for all. Uh, it's about harnessing India's demographic dividend. Now, jobs for all, demographic dividends, these are catchphrases we've been, we hear all the time. Uh, but eventually, what does it mean uh, from the government's perspective and from industry's perspective? What is it that we ought to be doing in order to realize the aspirations of this increasing workforce uh, in terms of finding gainful employment? So I think the focus ought to be not on jobs for all, but on productive jobs for all. Because it isn't a paucity of jobs uh, that is keeping uh, people away from the job market. It is about 
the right jobs, the good fit in the market. Now, we are obviously within uh, a group of friends, people who are uh, essentially business friendly. Uh, we are sitting at the, you know, the, the floor of the Bombay Stock Exchange. So in some sense, we are also preaching to the choir because the broad sentiments in terms of uh, what are the economic priorities, uh, what ought to be moving forward is, is uh, not extreme or, or that I'd imagine. So let's start by saying that you know, employment generation and skill development are two of the fundamental focus points uh, of this government. They have been for the past governments as well because these are natural for all emerging markets. However, for this government, it has attained a, a, a mission status uh, in various forms. Uh, we have seen escalation of these problems from the point of view of uh, resolution whether it is at the state government level, whether it is at the central government level. Skill development has acquired multiple uh, new dimensions, international cooperation, thinking of community colleges. Uh, you know, we have the new internship programs with, with, with Japanese government and so on and so forth. Some very promising pilots. Um, from the employment generation perspective, I think we can start by basically saying that while there is a, what I believe a false narrative which is catching fold in India, which is one of jobless growth, the data, if anything, basically points to the reverse. We do not, we are not witnessing a jobless growth. In fact, the Provident Fund data is very conclusively telling us that India is creating a large number of jobs. Is it enough? No, it is not enough. We are far behind what the benchmarks have been set. Uh, by the international community, by the Indian uh, economist and the government itself. But the trend is very robust and, and, uh, and, and which is only talking about the formal job creation in the market. There is a large segment which is informal. Now, in terms of the informal markets, because we, we are not in a position to measure these, the problem is really one of not just creation of jobs, but a second order one, which is of measurement. And how do we, how do we bring more and more people into you know, the formal fold of the economy in terms of formal employment is seen as a critical concern. But let me also be a bit provocative and tell you that there is almost no economic literature which basically says that productivity is necessarily linked with formality. Formality is really talking about bringing businesses within the realm of regulation. So if many businesses are choosing, because these are choices, to be below that radar, it really is a reflection of cost of regulation. So we still have a long way to go in terms of making the cost of regulation low enough so that more and more businesses do enter the formal fold. Okay? So while it might not be directly linked with productivity, it is a better measure of what the growth and a better indicator of what is the nature of job creation in the economy. The second is in terms of rural to urban. Now, rural to urban, while we do want to see this trend because this has been the natural trend globally, but it is also not something that we can you know, beat ourselves down on simply because of one, the magnitude of the problem, and the second is there is a natural absorption rate that cities have to be able to absorb this large flow of uh, people, labor, uh, from agriculture to, to urban areas, which is where there is such tremendous focus within this government, and rightfully so, in terms of job creation and opportunity of growth creation within the rural economies themselves. Because remember, rural India or rural uh, uh, sector is much more than cultivation. There is a lot to agriculture beyond just cultivation. So there is processing, there are several services sector, the back-end logistics, which are all part of the growing uh, productive part of the rural economy, which is beyond cultivation. And we have to recognize that as the growing source of uh, 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 GDP within agriculture. Now with uh, uh, those opening remarks, I also want to highlight one other point, which is that you know, to raise labor productivity. It is not just about jobs, as, as the initial set of comments when I made. It is about creating productive jobs for all. Raising labor productivity will also require that we invest tremendous amount of energy and focus of health and education. Because those are two 
fundamental factors which will determine the productivity of human capital of any country. And those are two sectors where we have traditionally over the last several decades, they have, we have been lacking. And where again you see there is a remarkable focus in the last couple of years in terms of getting our policies in terms of health and education right. Uh, we have seen the announcement of one of the largest health schemes in the form of Ayushman Bharat, whether it is the insurance element of it or whether it is the creation of wellness center. Eventually, this is about human capital productivity. The second is the education sector itself, where we have had uh, 62 new autonomous institutions uh, uh, status being given. And these are all moving in the right direction as far as raising uh, you know, uh, human capital productivity and positioning India as the global capital for human resources are concerned. So with those opening remarks, I would like to now uh, pose specific questions, whether it is on cost of regulation, which, which I will address to our uh, panelist, uh, Sri Amitabh Khan, the CEO of the Niti Aayog. Uh, and then in terms of what are those constraints, specifically that industry faces, and what are those opportunities where we, we have some hope in terms of movement, I will address to the industry represented by Sri Rajan Mittal and Sri Abhishek Lodha. So may I start with you, uh, Mr. Khan. How can the government reduce the cost of regulation to make it possible for more and more informal jobs to become formal? Uh, Shamika, first and foremost, uh, let, me, let me say that, uh, you know, the good thing is that the new payroll data is out, uh, EPFO, ESIC, and the NPS. And what it shows is that actually the country is growing with jobs. Jobs are getting created. And actually in the last uh, September to February data shows that a uh, good amount of jobs have been created. And another study by uh, on, with data analytics by Pulak Ghosh and Soumya of uh, S, Chief Economist of SBI shows that again jobs have been created uh, by good numbers. And earlier, uh, another study by McKenzie had shown that during the period 2014 to 17, India has created about 20 to 26 million job opportunities. So one that uh, this talk about growth without jobs is not correct. Uh, secondly, India is growing and it's creating jobs. Uh, but the important thing is that uh, I'm a great believer that if you want to jobs, you need to grow and you accelerate, need to accelerate growth. So let's not say that uh, uh, growth is key. And if we are growing at 7.5%, we need to accelerate growth. Uh, and challenge for India is, and everybody must start clearly thinking in those terms, that India needs to grow at rates of 9 to 10% over a three decade period. And what are the challenges to growth, to grow at 9 to 10% if you want to find productive jobs for a young population, where if 70% of your population is below the age of 35, then you need to bring in policies which will create jobs and enable you to grow at 9 to 10% and that should be your vision. And this would require several things. One is your labor laws are very antiquated. A study by Exim Bank has shown that your labor laws still remain the, the most antiquated labor laws. Only Pakistan has worse labor laws than India. So you need to set them right. I mean, there has to be political consensus around them to take forward-looking measures to do that. Secondly, the cost of logistics in India is still very high. You need to dismantle a lot of... Regular, I mean, good thing is that GST has been brought in. This is a major structural reform. But still, logistic costs are very high. 72% of goods in India are moved by road rather than rail. And therefore, you need to make the railway system of transportation far more efficient. And you need... Thirdly, we need to get size and scale right. That there are too many medium and small enterprises in India. Size and scale is critical to bring down, uh, you know, the cost of operation. This is critical. Fourthly, we must be very clear in our mind that you can't grow on the back of domestic markets. No country in the world, when several economists talk about this, that no, India has a vast domestic market. Let me tell you, no country in the world has grown on the back of domestic markets. India's vision and young Indian's mind must be very clear that the world is our market and India must capture global markets. Without capturing global markets, neither Japan, nor Korea, nor China, 
none of them have grown on the back of a vast domestic market. You have to penetrate global markets and this requires you to do size and scale and that requires you to become globally competitive. And globally comp if you become globally competitive, you'll produce to global size and scale and then you'll create jobs of that size and scale. This is critical. And the fifth point to my mind is very important that India has been a very, very reluctant urbanizer. You will create jobs if you urbanize and you make cities the dynamic centers of your growth. And India must understand this, that it's actually uh, cities which create their centers of growth, their centers of dynamism, their centers of great uh, job creation. World over, jobs are created by cities and therefore this urbanization and this government is the first government which has focused on 100 smart cities, it has focused on 50 metros and urbanization, India has got a huge opportunity. The process of urbanization has ended across America, it's ended across Europe, it's nearing completion in China but in India it's just begun and the next four to five decades, India has got this opportunity to do great innovative sustainable urbanization. When America did his urbanization, land, gas and water were cheaply available. These are scarce commodities and therefore India needs to do very innovative urbanization. The future lies in how do we recycle our water, how do we recycle our waste and these are great opportunities for job creation. And the last point I want to make is that the future of jobs lies in new technology. It lies in robotics, it lies in artificial intelligence, it lies in data analytics, it lies in internet of things, uh, cloud computing. These are areas of growth. India's, there's a skill mismatch in India. It's not that there are no jobs, there are jobs, but there's a need for higher skill. And you need higher skill jobs, which will be higher paid jobs. And therefore we need to absolutely bridge this gap of what do people across the world want. People want higher skill jobs and if we are able to provide those skill jobs, India will capture global markets for jobs. And we, look, we, need, we need to look at global market for jobs and not the domestic markets of jobs. And sixthly, the last point I want to make is that there is huge disguised unemployment in rural India. We need to, to think that uh, we need to focus on rural areas. You need to take people out of rural areas into urban areas and into manufacturing and into urbanization to create jobs. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Khan. In fact, uh, to the question of why is it that India has so many SMEs? You know, the initial uh, reason why we had, and most countries do this, so India is not uncommon, is that we, we have a concept of protecting the infant industries. Unfortunately, our infants have now become dwarfs. These infants are not going to grow simply because the dynamic efficiency that is required amongst firms to grow from small to medium to large, those dynamic inefficiencies have been lost. But conversely, this also is a reflection of the cost of regulation again. Why is it that when we look at the data, there is such large amount of bunching at the small category and at the medium category? So obviously, transitioning and natural growth is getting prohibited to some extent by the laws that we have. And to that effect, when he mentioned the antiquated labor laws, you know, the states have been quite proactive in, in, in this space, where we have had states of Rajasthan, Andhra, etc., experiment with new labor laws. But even there we are seeing that despite new laws coming in, there is a lot of job creation, but they remain unorganized. And that goes again to the notion of productivity is not necessarily linked with formal versus informal. This is the initial point that I made. That we are having this job creation, however, they remain in sectors which we are not able to capture adequately. So the focus now has to be towards capturing a lot of this productivity growth, uh, unfortunately, outside of the uh, formal sector. Uh, this takes me now to uh, uh, our second speaker, our second panelist, uh, Shri Rajan Mittal. Rajan, Again, back to the cost of compliance. The, the six points that Amitabh uh, pointed out, they all, these are, these are symptoms of a common disease, of something which binds us uh, uh, downwards. Now, how do you view industry's uh, 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 perspective of this problem? And then we can, if, if you could briefly also discuss about what are the opportunities you see in terms of what specific 
moves can the government at the center and some of the states experiment with? Thank you. Good morning. Uh, following after Amitabh, who's very passionate when he speaks, is a little tough job, but we'll try. You know, you took one fundamental uh, question which we need to raise and we need to reset that button, which has been discussed time over again, but probably has always been missed, is really the education system of this country. You know, the fundamental growth country that you would have seen across the globe over the period of time is always the education that actually brings everything together. If you really see a system, we are far too academic and including all of us who are parents, all you need to see your children is how bright you are academically. And if you really see the mismatch today, and Amitabh is right, there are enough jobs which are there, but people are not employable. People are not skill trained. People have just gone to school, the colleges, got universities and out, and they're completely a mismatch of jobs. Can India be left behind with such a young population? And also we have to understand, and I've had you know, many chats with a whole lot of political leadership, days are gone when you can give dole. People need jobs, people need to work. I can understand rural, urban, we can discuss uh, as well as how that is going to move, but if you don't give jobs, the social fabric of this country itself will be under challenge. How do you manage such a younger population? And especially, I, I travel across because of my businesses in telecom across the country, and I can tell you, you go to rural areas, there are young uh, men and women just idling around on the streets, on the, on the curbside. And if you have a conversation with them, they can't move to urbanization because there are many challenges, rural are not getting jobs, they're not getting educated, so that becomes a stress. And if India has to play a global role, as Amitabh has said, the data shows that if you have to be at a, at a level of countries that we are, we need to grow 18% for coming two to three decades. At least 12% to sustain the momentum that we are doing. India is a shining story, there's no doubt. We are growing seven, seven and a half percent. But is that good enough? That's not good enough because the challenges are surmounting much greater. Amitabh spoke about that the scale has to be done. Of course, scale has to be done. But our mindset has been over the decades that you can't grow, you have to be restrictive. Thankfully, that is behind us now. You have companies which are global companies, including my own company, which I can say has grown from nothing, is a global company today. So there is enough opportunity that India is providing today to create their global giants. Yes, there will be challenges of a country of this size, of this magnitude, of a democracy. That is bound to happen. You can't wish them away. We need to find a way. But also the structuring in this country has been little, I would say, not correct. India's GDP today, 60% is almost with services. It is bursting to its seams. Agriculture, manufacturing need to really up the game. You cannot have a country which is only going to run on services. And those challenges on manufacturing, if I were to say, are we far behind than most of our Asian peers? The answer is yes. If you really look at the cost of manufacturing here, it's not doable to become a global scale uh, player here. It's not doable. You can't get land. You, interest rates, if you see, you can never manufacture in this country. Infrastructure is not there. You can't have just in time as all our peers do around Asia. Uh, la labor laws have been well spoken about. Some states are trying to do that job and they must do it. It's a hard call, but you've got to take that hard call. Otherwise, it will not happen. So if you really put the five factors, how the manufacturing is done, we are not competitive. So if you are not competitive, you are not going to make it a global scale. So the first fundamental issue is how do we become competitive? And this is where the capital formation has to come into play because without that, you are not going to create global companies. So really, there are many subsets that needs to be done and that needs to be done in partnership with the industry. I am not saying this is only the government's job, the industry also play, has to play it rightly. The, way India is moving now, it can work both ways. While we talk about artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, and a whole lot of things that are coming in, can India afford to really adopt to those technologies and see more jobs not being created? Because that will happen. You go to the manufacturing units today where people used to do jobs for 12 people, today with automation, you're left with four or five people. So there will be a negative side also, while there is a huge opportunity for this country to come around. So regulation has to play its fair share, regulation has to play its fair role. Governments need to also think 
that if there is a growth that is being talked about, they will be at the end of the day profitability. And profitability is not a bad word. You cannot say that the companies who are, will be creating jobs should not be profitable because if you are not profitable, you are not going to create jobs. I think there is a direct correlation. That mindset also has to change. So we are all, we always engaged and we always tell them that at the end of the day, both industry needs to find the golden mean. We are not trying to say here that you need to create monopolies. That is not the intention. But try, try to create a golden mean where it can work. Thank you, Rajan. Those were excellent set of points. <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you focused on the manufacturing just as Amitabh did as well. Because again, there is a false narrative that must be dispelled, which is India has missed the manufacturing bus. It's a very false narrative because globally, you have about 4 billion people that are growing out of poverty, that are going to demand low-end electronics, footwear, clothes, and that mass market has to be supplied to. And India has to be part of that. Despite not being competitive, it is not an objective that we can shun. It cannot be at the, at, at the cost of uh, uh, you know, policy reforms which will make India competitive. So to, to say that India has missed the bus is something we should put aside. It's, it's, it's quite a, a, a false narrative. Uh, we must squarely focus on, on making the manufacturing sector more uh, competitive, not just because of our domestic markets, but also from a global perspective. And the fact that exports within manufacturing should also be one of our uh, uh, key policy priorities. Now, that shifts... Uh, the focus now to uh, Abhishek Loda. Abhishek, uh, Rajan has spoken about the broad set of uh, issues that industry is grappling with uh, and trying to work in tandem with the government because the goals are similar. What are your views, uh, specifically uh, from the perspective of your industry? Uh, uh, I think, you know, listening to uh, Mr. Kant, it's very clear that the government is, you know, well aware of what the policy-related measures that needed to be taken to address uh, the economic potential gap. Okay, uh, the economic potential gap that we have in our country. Uh, you know, I'm obviously not as well informed as the other two speakers, and so I'll stay away from, you know, suggestions on policy, etc., but I'll just be a little, I would say, uh, stimulate a little bit of a debate by being anecdotal and share some, I would say, some interesting facts. So, last year, as, you know, we are one of India's larger real estate developers, we, we delivered about 12,000 units. Um, in the Indian context, 12,000 is quite big. But then I said, you know, internally, let's, let's benchmark ourselves against where we are in the world. So this is what came out. Uh, the largest uh, amount of housing created uh, by a single company in the UK is about 16,000 homes. That's a population of about 70 million people. We are 1.2 billion people. Uh, the largest amount of housing created in the US is about 50,000 homes, and that's about 350 million people. And in China, there are three companies doing 200,000 homes annually. And this has now been going on for 20 years. So the question therefore came to, my, to our mind, India isn't short of a desire to, for individuals to own homes. Uh, urbanization is something that is being encouraged by the government. Uh, there have been many policies which facilitate, you know, all the normal bugbears of the industry like faster approvals, etc., etc. And yet, we're talking about a situation where in a country where so much employment, real estate and construction today uh, is probably the largest, or if not the largest, the second largest employer in the country. And uh, for p per unit of investment or per unit of spend in that industry, the multiplier effects on GDP are by far the highest compared to any industry. And yet, we are one twentieth of the size of uh, the largest Chinese company, and forget China because you know we can say there are many, many exceptions. But if you look across the world, we are much smaller. The question is why. Uh, a similar second anecdote. You know, we've been growing at seven, seven and a half percent for almost 20 years. We saw that oh, since 91 to 2018 recently, I think the FT published it. India was the fourth fastest growing country for the last 27, 28 years when measured across the globe, and yet. When it looks at happiness rankings, India is 130th or so 
across, you know, about 170, 180 countries which were reviewed. Normally, when you have consistent economic growth, the level of perception of well-being goes up and happiness should be higher. If you look at both these anecdotes together, the question then comes to mind is, there is a lot of policy initiative, a lot of new things, especially under this government, have been happening. And our economy is been growing well. And yet, we are undersized, going to the size of, you know, whether we have global scale or we don't have global scale, and we are unhappy. As a nation, we are unhappy. And if I, sort of thinking about that, my, my thought process is that that's because we haven't yet come to a national consensus on what is our mindset when it comes to economic development. What is the Indian model of capitalism? We talk about the Chinese model of capitalism, which says, you know, you get all economic freedoms, etc., etc. The government will do very well in all sectors, except communism, as the price to pay for that. Different countries have such different models. What is the Indian, what is the agreement or consensus in India of the model of capitalism to follow, if capitalism is the model to follow? There is often, of, of course, a debate between capitalism and different forms of socialism, etc. And my view uh, to this is that till we form that national consensus, we will continuously move three steps forward and two and a half steps back on an ongoing basis. And that is the cause of unhappiness. Because every time everybody, anybody with aspiration wants to move forward, some part of the system, it could be policy implementers, because I think the policy makers are very clear, they want to head in a particular direction. It could be policy implementers, or it could be parts of society or, or so on, push us back. And that back and forth leads to this economic output gap that we continuously see, the subscaling of industries that we see, and the unhappiness that pervades. And therefore, uh, my own view is that there needs to be an agreement in the nation, uh, you know, which of course has to happen starting at the leadership level and then going across different stakeholders, that whether we are all right for the next 15 years in agreeing that profit and jobs go hand in hand. Everybody who creates jobs will be seeking to create profits. And whether we as a nation are willing to say that anybody who creates jobs is going to be supported. We don't worry about whether he's making extraordinary profits, whether he's making little profit, whether he's making a little bit of a loss, whatever it may be. As long as every company is made to, for example, put on their balance sheets, their direct employment, their indirect employment, the median wage that they pay for their direct employees and the median wage that they pay for their indirect employees. If that becomes a mandate on every p &L statement, every balance sheet, and the nation's policy making says anybody who creates jobs will be supported. We realize the fact that profit and jobs are two sides of the same coin. And as long as we want high quality jobs, which is very clear that we do want, we have to be willing to go out and stay that profit is good, we will support in every possible way people who create profit along with jobs. And then to complete the idea of what India's form of capitalism should be, I think India's, cap even if we were to accept that profit-oriented, job-creating form of capitalism, it's very important to remember that today 250 million people in India are employed in low-value agriculture. And the real need, if you were to look at getting them to a good per capita income is only 50 million people. So my submission is that the Indian model of capitalism has to accept that for the next 15 to 20 years, we have to have a special earmarking for making those 250 million people in agriculture better off by the idea of a universal basic income or something similar for those who are engaged in basic agriculture. And if we agree to this or any other variant of a national consensus, then we can all move forward with policy, implementation, and social activity all moving in one direction rather than moving back and forth, which I think is to today what is holding us back. Thank you, Abhishek. <laughs> a national consensus. Yes, that's something we, we, we should think of a great deal more. Uh, because that, that really does tell us about the real costs of democracy. But remember that these are also matters that keep the variance within the country low. So when we move, though we move slowly, it's a more robust movement than in, 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 in countries where, which are not democratic. 
where you see that there is much more decisive decision making and movement, but, but we don't know what is the, the uh, long term variability of, of those and what is the robustness of those institutions. But uh, I'll come back to uh, two specific points, going back to Amitabh's opening remarks. Uh, one is on urbanization and the second is on technology. Now, smart cities has definitely elevated the, the uh, reform agenda as far as urbanization is concerned. It is seen as one of those schemes of the government which should be attracting a lot of foreign direct investment, a lot of private investment because uh, there are several low hanging fruits. These are also large investment projects. Uh, the movement in terms of that has been greatly varied. So Amitabh, while we have seen some states seize this opportunity and make good use of the smart cities platform, we are seeing enormous movement there are several others because of the natural, uh, you know, the, the, the endowments and, and governance in these states that holds them back. What do we do about a problem such as this? The great variance in terms of urbanization effort across the country. I think, uh, you know, it's important to give it a little time because uh, we must be very clear in our mind that uh, the process of urbanization uh, has been going around unabated in India in a very unscientific, unplanned manner. This is the first time you are doing planned urbanization. And you need to do it with very scientific planning, with public transportation at the back of it. And your model has to be that your cities have to be done on the back of, you know, American cities were all made for cars. Actually, the car companies bought over railway companies, destroyed them. Uh, that's why you have cities like Atlanta where 99.8% of the people travel by cars. It's important that India doesn't repeat those mistakes because the per capita usage of car is still very low in India. And we therefore need to make cities uh, with embedded public transportation system, mass rapid transport system, cities for cycling and walking. And therefore, this kind of planning requires time. And once this momentum takes off, as it is doing, I mean, if you go to Shendra, Bedkin, if you go to Dhalera, these are big cities being made, you know, f f uh, 300 kilometers. Go to Shendra, Bedkin and see for yourself what is happening there. I mean, it's a new city like new Mumbai being created or Dhalera, a new Calcutta being created. I mean, this kind of a thing has never happened in India. Five new cities on the back of Delhi-Mumbai Industrial Corridor. So, another two, three years, you'll see the whole momentum of smart cities blossoming out in a very big way. Well, the important thing is that when you start embedding this process of recycling of water, recycling of waste, good scientific planning is very critical and give it a little breathing time. Indians are too impatient and especially economists like you are too <laughs> impatient. You know, so the, the, it's very important to plan well. India gets in execution without proper planning. That's been the big fault of India. We start cracking things. You know, once you've planned to perfection, you plan it to perfection. The exhibition, the execution will be quicker, faster, and implement. And India needs to then focus on implementation, implementation, and implementation. But a number of other points were made by two very distinguished uh, people, Mr. Rajan and Mr. Loda, who are really the gems of Indian entrepreneurship. And one of the points which uh, Rajan made was about, uh, you know, this uh, system of education, which I entirely agree with him because India has inherited this. Anglo-Saxon system of education where if you keep studying books and keep passing and then uh, passing from 8th to 10th and 10th to 12th and then getting into college and then getting into post-graduation uh, becomes the key objective of your life. So one of the key things this government has done is, and I think this is the biggest disruption being caused today, that we've started about close to 2,500 tinkering labs in schools. We've uh, provided robots, 3D printers, uh, additive manufacturing, uh, internet of things, all at school level. And our target is that in the next three years, we'll do about 30,000 schools. Uh, Atal Tinkering Labs and through the Atal Innovation Mission is one of the biggest 
disruption any country has ever brought anywhere in the world. And when class six students start playing around with robots and 3D printers, we're building a completely new innovative India. And let me also say that a lot of innovation is happening in India. You know, I mean, if you, if you look at Bangalore and Hyderabad and Pune and Gurgaon, many of the innovations for the rest of the world is happening here. I mean, GE's uh, new ECG machine, which they've done at one-tenth the cost of what they do in USA, or John Dickery's 60 HP tractor, which they do, or Philips low-cost sound recording machine, all innovated in India, or Reynolds Quid, all designed, innovated, manufactured in India. So a lot of this innovation of great combination of innovation, uh, technology and skills has led to great frugal engineering from India, which has penetrated global markets, and we must accept that. And the third point I wanted to make is, when uh, Mr. Loda talked about uh, this philosophy, the philosophy is, of course, uh, jobs come from profit and profit and that leads to growth and that's why this government has focused very strongly on making India very easy and simple. You know, last 70 years we've been adding rules, regulation, procedures, uh, one after another, one after another, one after another, making things difficult for private sector to create wealth in India. This is the government which has knocked out 1,200 laws. It has knocked out number of procedures, rules, regulations, all across the board. And that's why India has jumped up 42 positions on the ease of doing business. We've created a sense of competition among states. States are competing competing with each other. Uh, you know, first year we did this, Gujarat came number one, next year we did this, Andhra, Telangana, uh, Chhattisgarh, uh, you know, Jharkhand, they all jumped up like anything. So the eastern part of India, once it starts improving, as it has done on ease of doing business, will make India grow and jump. And that's why I'm very confident that the Prime Minister's new initiative of aspirational district, I'm not a great believer in uh, universal basic income at all, but Prime Minister's new initiative of aspirational district focusing on 115 districts of India, which have, you know, these are backward districts. He doesn't call them backward. He calls them aspirational districts. But we are focusing on education, 30% marks, 30% on health, 20% uh, on agriculture, skill and financial inclusion. And we are creating a sense of competition amongst these districts. And once these districts start competing, uh, states are, uh, are, are focusing on these, uh, on these. And the plain challenge there is good governance. And once we are able to improve these districts, 115 districts, learning outcomes will improve, health outcomes will improve, the country will jump up in the Human Development Index. And that's my belief. That's Once you create uh, new learning outcomes and health outcomes and improve nutrition in India, you'll create a completely new uh, generation of people who will be employable across India. Great. Thank you. In fact, uh, your latter half of your comments directly address the question that I put to you, which is the great variation that we are seeing in the country. That we have some states which are shining and moving very fast. The others are aspirational, backward, whatever you call. But there is movement on threefold. One is where investments have to be public in nature simply because they are so far away from this golden mean in terms of development. And that is the aspirational, and the government is going to be largely a player in those. And then there you have a middle rung uh, where, where you had tier two cities, which have put, put such excellent proposals in the smart cities uh, competition that, that we should see the second uh, tier also sort of catch up. And then, of course, you have the large uh, cities and, and the large centers of growth and engines of growth which are doing. So hopefully, while you do have three different paces of growth, there will be convergence. There is a great uh, convergence. But because you picked on economists, I have to give some back to you, which is, why do you think that when government jobs open up across the country, so many qualified professionals still apply for these jobs? What is symptomatic of this great problem that we are uh, unable to handle? Why are so many well-qualified people still applying for public sector job? Could it be symptomatic of further administrative reforms, further lack of control, further uh, uh, strengthening of all these alternate opportunities that Rajan and Abhishek were speaking about? That new opportunities have to emerge in through education, through health, within industry, such that people gravitate towards those jobs rather than seeking government jobs. 
And, and we, I would ideally like a response from all three of you because this is a job spanner. What can the government do to reduce its own powers as far as these jobs are concerned? And what can industry do in terms of attracting more people, more talent, uh, away from um, some of these government jobs? So Amitabh, if we could start with you. Uh, Shamika, I think you've made a very important point and to my mind, uh, the biggest opportunity biggest opportunity for this country lies in opening up its social sectors, health and education. We've controlled and cabined them for too long and uh, this government again has focused very strongly, I mean it's unleashed this huge amount of reform in the higher education sector which has not been adequately written about, it's focused on learning outcomes in uh, schools which has not been much talked about and it's, uh, you know, it's uh, opening up the health sector with 150,000 uh, wellness centers at the panchayat level and then the whole uh, health insurance scheme, national health protection scheme which will provide insurance coverage to almost 50 crore people in India up to 5 lakhs and which will be the biggest health protection scheme anywhere in the world. Uh, so this will open up very, very vast opportunities across and this will actually ensure that at the grassroots, and I'm a great believer that primary health care, uh, government must bring in great efficiencies and therefore uh, once you open this health and wellness center at the grassroots, you will provide huge opportunities and sim similarly in the insurance sector, you will provide very vast opportunities. So these two sectors and the government has done a lot in the nutrition sector actually to improve India's nutrition standards. Uh, five or six very major initiatives have been taken on the nutrition sector. I mean, many initiatives which, which have been taken, I mean, uh, much more initiatives have been taken in the last three, four years than in the last uh, uh, seven decades. So nutrition has been a big focus to improve the uh, nutrition standards in India. So these will, uh, these will open up uh, very, very, very vast opportunities to, to my mind in the coming years. Uh, <coughs> What is the other thing you said? The, the flow of talent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the, f uh, the flow of uh, talent, once you open up these sectors, you will find that uh, many of these sectors uh, absorbing. But you know, I think that is also, I was pleasantly surprised when the director IIT of uh, Mumbai uh, told me that actually uh, close to about 40 to 41 percent of the people who passed out of IIT Mumbai actually either started their own startup or, uh, uh, you know, they joined a startup. Uh, these, these are very dynamic. I mean, a young girl in India who taught nine, in, in 9 million Indians how to speak English in one year. No school, no college has done it. She's done it through a startup. Hello, English. You know, I mean, look at what uh, Baiju is doing in education. Mark Zuckerberg has invested his personal money into it. Or look at what uh, young women entrepreneurs like Meena Ganesh and Shanti Mohan are doing. I mean, they are disrupting the whole process of startup in India with, on health, on, uh, on investments and many other areas. I mean, vast number of uh, amazing disruption being carried out by the startups. So I think the, the whole world of getting into government is changing. I mean, only lousy people like me are getting into government now. <laughs> All bright young people are doing their own uh, startups now. Yeah. So there's huge energy, vibrancy, and dynamism in the startup movement and in the innovation world today. So on the technology front, Rajan, there is research to show that for every X amount of job that is lost due to new technology and automation, a multiple of that is created because of new technology. In the Indian context, do you see technology as a threat, uh, automation as a threat to job creation? You know, uh, technology you cannot stop. We have to adopt it. Countries who have decided to go against technology have suffered. So a country like India should not and probably will not stop technology. The march of technology has happened. It's not under my or anybody's control or the government's control. But the job losses that will happen will absolutely adequately compensate with the new jobs that are being created. I mean, you look at e-commerce. Just to give one example, Sachin is not here. He would have spoken probably more deeply on this subject. But look at one particular thing which has really started on the e Millions of jobs are happening today. Not only directly, indirectly. The people who are serving, the courier services, the, you know, it's a different job market has never existed. Look at the Olas and the Ubers of the world. Look at the OS of the world. These are all technology-led. These are all technology platforms. Look at the jobs they have created. Humongous jobs have been created. We have discussed and, and Amitabh said that Indians are very impatient. 
I would disagree with that. Indians have been far too patient. That's why where we, we are, where we are and you talk about the government jobs because people still believe that government will not go anywhere. If a government PSU failed, they will be much compensated by the government itself. So that job is secure. It will not happen in the private sector. So that's why it shocks me when I read in the newspaper there for 100 jobs there are kind of some 100,000, 200,000 people have applied and I wonder sometimes why it is happening. It's for the reason our mindsets haven't changed but we are on the path of changing that mindset because the industry is becoming robust, the private entrepreneurship is coming in. He gave many examples, they are all technology led at the end of the day. If you really see the startups are all technology led, most of them in India. And India is becoming a hub and it should become. If you see around the globe, if you went in the 80s, Japan was the place for innovation. And you know, I, I used to go a lot to Japan, I can tell you, I went just last week. I found stagnated country because they've lost the race of innovation. Why does the US always maintain its pole position? Because the research institutes, the institutions, the innovation, the cutting edge technologies, they don't manufacture, but the proprietary is with them. China has done extremely well. The Koreans of the world have come in. I think it is India's turn. And I have to say, particularly this government has been in the forefront of enhancing the technology side. And we are seeing the kind of investors who are coming in this country, predominantly technology-led. Prime Minister himself is very tech-savvy, I have to say. Probably is more tech-savvy than a whole lot of people who are sitting out in this room. So he's really very much clear that technology march will happen. India will play its role in that. And we must encourage innovation. We must encourage, we must encourage startups. We must encourage failures. This country, why it has not grown to the proportion that it should have grown, we don't like failures. If a president of America can be a president of America after many failures, we must allow young people to become at least entrepreneurs. Wonderful. Thank you. That's basically talking about the culture of growth where uh, risk aversion, entrepreneurship uh, is, is absolutely opposed to this culture of risk aversion that you're talking about. And entrepreneurship then requires that as a society we, we, we also acknowledge failures because that really is uh, a mark of attempt and, and, and entrepreneurship. Um, now, before I open, we have 15